Welcome to Calvary Albuquerque. We pursue the God who is passionately pursuing a lost world. We do this with one another. Through worship, by the word, to the world. My wife and I recently got a painting. Several months back, we, we got this painting from a friend of ours. She's a local artist, and it's one of the largest paintings. It is the largest painting that we have. And, and so being that that was the case, four feet wide, three feet high, we, we were trying to figure out where are we supposed to put this in our house? Like, where's the, the, there, that much real estate on one of these walls? And so we decided to, to hang it up above our stairs this is a really cool piece of a moon. And uh, we decided to put it above our stairs so that in our living room, while we're hanging out downstairs in the living room, sitting on the couch, we can, we can see it from that angle, but so that we can also see it when we wake up in the morning and we're coming downstairs, get ready for the day, that we can see this painting that we really like. And, and it's a large wall for that. But being that it's been in our house for several months, We'll glance at it out of the corner of our eye. And every time that we do, we appreciate it. It's got cool colors. But being that it's been there for a little while, it's just kind of become a part of the house. We don't necessarily notice it every day and spend time really gazing at it. Now, every once in a while, I will sit on the steps of my stairs and I'll just look at this and I'll, I'll really study the colors and how they blend together. And I'll look at, at the brush strokes and the sponge drops on that. And during those times where I'm really giving a lot of my attention towards this painting, I find that it, that it has a lot of my affection and that I appreciate it so much greater. And the reason that I bring this up is because as believers, sometimes it's easy for us to become callous to the truths that we hear often. Hopefully, we're spending time in God's word every day. And hopefully, as we're looking at his word, we're grateful for it. But my prayer tonight is that that would be, become common in our quiet times, but that tonight as well, we would step onto those stairs, we would sit down and we would study the color of God's character, that we would gaze at his greatness, that we would see the textures of his goodness and of his grace. And so that's my prayer for us tonight, is that we, that we see these realities and we open ourselves up to be impacted by them. Would you join me in prayer, echoing that same prayer? Father, that is precisely what we want to see. We want to see you. And we want to open ourselves up to you. And we want to look at your word. And we want to see the God that is demonstrated in this word. And Father, we want to offer ourselves to be attentive during this time. And Father, we want to offer ourselves to receive from you during this time and then to give back to you during this time. And we're excited, Lord, to sing to you. Lord, I ask that you would be with us tonight, that you would touch our hearts, that you would impact us with your truth. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to be in Psalm 8. You can turn there. We're going to be spending a little bit of time in the first four verses of Psalm 8. But summer is upon us. It's the middle of the summer. Usually with summer comes vacation, right? Has anybody gone on vacation yet this summer? Probably. No. Wow. There's like three people in here. So probably even fewer of you are going to be able to say yes to this next question that, I was going to, that I'm going to ask. Uh, how many of you have been able to visit Disneyland this summer, Disney World, one of the Disney parks? Oh, actually, how are more of you visiting Disney than going on vacation? That does, those numbers do not compute. When I was a child, we used to make it a point every few years to, to make it to Disneyland. I've got, some, I've got grandparents in Southern California, so we'd visit them, check out Disneyland. One of the most fun things about going to Disneyland is, a, is going with somebody that's never been before. Because as soon as you pay your $120 and you go in those gates, <laughs> they see Mickey Mouse's face made out of this garden of flowers. And they walk in and they're just like, flowers making up Mickey Mouse's face? My flowers at home just look like flowers. 
And then, and then they turn the corner and you, you, you find yourself on Main Street and you're walking past all of these storefronts that seems like they've been ripped out of the movies of Disney and plopped down into real life. And so their eyes are wide open. They're excited and maybe out of the corner of their eye they see Mickey or Pluto or Minnie or now Star Wars characters because that's crazy. And then as they continue in to Disneyland or Disney World, whichever park it is, their view opens up and they see those iconic castles They're at the beginning of every Disney movie. And going with a first timer to Disneyland, their eyes are wide open and maybe their jaw is a few inches lower than it's supposed to be. And this is something that I call the magic kingdom mindset. The magic kingdom mindset where your eyes are open, where your jaw is dropped because you're in awe of something that you're looking at. Incredible, amazing, awesome, absolute wonder. And that is the mindset that David seems to have as he pens this psalm in Psalm 8. And it's my prayer that we would have this mindset throughout our lives as we have a relationship with the Lord. But look at the first four verses with me. David writes, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, who have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have ordained strength because of your enemies that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him? Well, this psalm, like many others, is, of course, a song. And so because it's a song, it has the makeup of a song. It has the parts of a song. It has a chorus. It has a few verses. And he starts off in verse 1 of chapter 8, and that's, that's the chorus. And we see it because it's repeated. It, it, it's, it's right at the beginning in verse 1, and then he repeats that same truth in verse 9. O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name. And so we're going to examine that chorus for a little bit, and then we're going to look at the, second ver or the first verse in the song, and then we're going to see him go into an, another verse and we're going to examine some of these things and hopefully pull truths from them. But he starts with this chorus. Oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth who have set your glory above the heavens. The word that immediately stands out to me is excellent. Excellent. How excellent is your name. And the Hebrew word is adir. So it's ado, adir. A female deer is an easy way to remember that. Not the best, best pronunciation, but, but it is. It's a, it's a deer. And uh, other translations that we could use or other words that we could use to describe that word is, Oh, Lord, our Lord, how great or how mighty or how glorious. Or maybe this is the one that you find in your translation. How majestic, how majestic is your name. Now, when David writes this, and he has this idea of majesty in his mind, when I hear that word majesty, it's hard for me to think of anything other than royalty. My mind immediately goes to royalty. And even more specifically, I think of the coat of arms for the, for the royal family in the UK, in England, how there's that lion that's wearing a crown and it's just like this majestic creature with this gnarly gold crown on. And interesting enough, I, I was watching a video this morning. It was, it was posted on a news site that I follow and I usually don't mention which news sites I follow because I'm either gonna upset half of you on this side or I'm gonna upset the other half over here because it's like, who's got the real news? I don't know. But anyways, I was on a news site this morning and I was watching this video and the question is, how much, how much money does Queen Elizabeth make every year and how much is she worth? And it goes through and it, and it shows all of these gnarly pictures of where she lives, Buckingham Palace and these chariots that she's riding around in. And, and, and that's the idea of majesty. So I wanted to, 
wanted to ask you, what, it, what would it look like if you were invited to Buckingham Palace? What would it look like if you were invited to have a dinner there? Well, of course, you'd come to the outside, you'd pull up to the front of it, and you'd see something like this. Pretty gorgeous. I mean, that's like probably more than $1,000 rent a, a month, right? <laughs> it's a pretty good mortgage on that. It's a, it's a nice place. And then you wander inside and you've got to make your way to the, to the dining room. You've got to make your way to the banquet hall. So you go up some, some golden staircases because who doesn't have those? You've got red carpets. And then finally you do make your way to your, your seat at the, at the dinner table and you're hanging out in this room. But then maybe around dessert time, you get a little like bored and you're like, oh man, I want to explore more. I'm in such a cool place. I wonder what some of the other rooms are. So you find your way into the garage just to check out what kind of rides they have hanging out. <laughs> so majesty, how majestic, how magnificent, how over the top, how otherly, how unordinary. And David was obviously familiar with royalty. He was the king of Israel. So for him to say how majestic, how majestic is the name of God, it carried a little bit of weight in it, in that statement. But what's the deal with his name? Why is he focusing on the name of God so much? Why the name? Why not just the, the person of God? Well, notice again, verse one, it starts out, O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name. Now, some of you may have failed English in high school, but several times the English language fails us. And you'll notice, you'll, there's a little bit of help here because you'll notice that the first time that the word Lord appears there, it's what? It's all caps, right? Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. And then the second time that it shows up, just the L is capitalized, right? And so if you're a student of the Bible, you know the significance of this. It's not just the repetitious, it's not just a repetitious uh, version of the same word going over and over. It's to denote not just the name of God, but then also the title of God. See, the Lord, with all four letters capitalized, is something that we call the tetragrammaton. And so many of you know this. And some of you are like, the Tetris grammar what? But it's the, the tetragrammaton, Y-H-W-H, -H is, is maybe the, the translation that we would use. Some of us would uh, pronounce that Yahweh. But what's important to notice is that the Jews revered God so much, and they saw that his name was so holy that it became something that we call ineffable. It was something that they dare not utter from their lips because if they utter that name in any way that was undue its worth, it would be considered blasphemy because the name of God, the, the word that represents God's personhood to them was far beyond them. It was far too holy for them to dare utter. Now, this name of God was first spoken to man by God in Exodus 3 when Moses, when he meets Moses in a burning bush and he commissions Moses, I want you to go into Egypt. I want you to free these people. And he has all these things. Moses has all these, all these reasons why he's not the guy. And then he says, well, who should I say sent me? And he says, tell him that I am sent me. I am that I am. And at that time, God first communicates, he first expresses this personal covenant name to Moses. And then we find it some 6,828 more times throughout scripture. You see, God doesn't just give us a title. He doesn't just say, well, I'm, I'm the one who has created everything. I am master, I am Lord, I am God. No, he expresses because he loves us and because he desires relationship with us, he expresses to us his very name. And notice that Paul makes, or that David makes this personal. He says, O oh Lord, our Lord. He doesn't say, O oh Lord, the Lord, which he very well could have. 
But he adds that personal pronoun, O Lord, O Yahweh, our Lord. Some of us need to remember that God is, is, is not this far off, distant being, but he wants to be near. He desires relationship. He desires fellowship with you. I love another phrase that pops up some five times in the Bible. He tells the children of Israel, I will be your God. I will be your God. And you will be my people. And of course, those of you who are students of the Bible, you also know that what David is getting at here is that it's not just a special name, but names biblically represent the character and the person associated with them. And so what we're going to see is that this is the main chorus of this song is how excellent is this God? How amazing, how majestic is this God that we serve? And then the next two verses, the next two ideas that we're going to look at support that claim. And so let's look at that. The next verse, verse two, we see the praise of children. Verse two, out of the mouth of babes and nurse, nursing infants, you have ordained strength because of your enemies that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. The NIV puts it this way, through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. What's interesting about this is that it demonstrates to us this idea that God doesn't always need the biggest, baddest guy on his team. In fact, he doesn't need really anyone on his team. He invites us to be on his team. But but when he's facing his enemies, he's not looking for the, the largest weapon in the arsenal. He's happy to use the, the singing and the praise of children. He doesn't need a PhD to defend him. He'll use the praises of a child. And Jesus actually quotes this verse when he's confronted in Matthew 21, Jesus has just finished with the triumphal entry. He comes into Jerusalem and people are laying down their palm branches and they're putting their cloaks on the ground. And he's on this donkey going into the city. And as he makes his way in, people are shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna. And they're praising him and they're worshiping him because they realize that he is their Messiah. And so they worship him as such. And as he goes into the city, the children continue worshiping worshiping Hosanna to the son of David. And the chief priests and the scribes were told, they start rebuking him and they say, Jesus, turn these kids away. Can't you hear what they're saying? You need to rebuke them. You need to correct them. And he quotes to them this. He says, yes, haven't you read out of the mouths of babes and nursing infants, you have perfected praise. And what we see here is a principle that comes up often throughout scripture is that God often chooses the weakest weapon to fight the enemy. And why is that? It's because the strength doesn't come from the tool. The strength comes from who's holding that tool, right? And so David was just a little teenager delivering quesadillas to his brothers while they're supposed to be fighting a battle, but God ends up using this babe, this weak teenager who trusted in a big God to defeat Israel's greatest enemy at that time. Gideon had 300 dudes with him. He had 300 troops. That's like the balcony. If the balcony's full, that's about 300 people to defeat 135,000 Midianites. Why? Because God wanted the bragging rights. He wanted to be able to say that, hey, I did this. This isn't something that you did yourself. He often uses the weakest weapon in the arsenal so that his strength is on full display. 
Daniel was just a young kid who stood before kings. And we're told in Daniel 2 that as he stood before the king, the king determined that he was 10 times wiser than the astrologers and his advisors. So there's a little bit of 1 Corinthians 1.27 going on here, that, that, that God has chosen the foolish things of the world to, to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things that are mighty. Listen, you may feel weak. You may feel wholly insignificant. You may feel completely small, useless, incapable, and that is what makes you perfect for the job that God has for you because he wants to put his strength on display. And guys, he is a big God. He is a strong God. You know, he is made much of when the tools and the instruments that he's using don't try to make much of themselves. And so next time that we feel like we're less than or that we're incapable, instead of trying to puff ourselves up and, and make ourselves believe that we are something great, just allow all of the attention to be focused on the one who truly is great. He transitions into his second verse. It's actually verse three, but the second verse of the song. And we're going to notice the proclamation of creation. Verse three, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you have visited him? Man, all of the heaven, heavens and the earth declare with a loud voice that we serve this immense and great and powerful and strong God. And that's exactly the point that Paul makes in Romans 1 is that, that, that every one of us, everyone that exists is without excuse because when we look at creation, there is one conclusion. There is a creator and he is magnificent. And this was a common theme of David's throughout the Psalms. I think that David had himself a hammock because we turn to Psalm 19 and we see that the heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. David was often, probably because he was a shepherd, spending time in those fields looking up at these skies. The stars, he sees the moon, and he doesn't worship them, he worships the one that created them. And I think that's a good spiritual practice to put in place in our lives, is to go look at the stars, to go get out in nature and observe this world that the Lord has created. Not so that we can become one with nature and, oh, well, I'm, you know, I've got my chi going on now. But so that we can recognize that there is a God who has created this. And I say these words and we hear these truths so often, but I wonder how often we actually hear them. There is a God who hung stars in the sky, who fashioned this rock that's spinning around the sun that we call earth and home that has another tiny rock circling around it. Like this sounds like a fairy tale. Did the Grimm's brothers write this? We live in a pretty magical world, but, but that's because we serve a real God. And so he allowed his stargazing to point him to the one that created the stars. We live in a, in a really fantastic world though. Did you know that there are some 100 billion stars in this galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy? 100 billion stars. I, I hear that number and I don't even know how to quantify that. That's just like, it, it just becomes ethereal and abstract at that point. It's just like 100 billion. I don't even know what that looks like. But that's just this little galaxy that we're in called the Milky Way. You know, there's another galaxy, the Andromeda galaxy, and it's got another 100 billion stars. And it's, it's just the nearest galaxy. It's just another galaxy near us. And so those two galaxies together are some 200 billion 
stars. But then you go online and you Google, how many galaxies are there? And you start seeing picture after picture after picture because the Hubble telescope and crazy flying instruments hanging out in the vacuum of space. And how does that work? But you find out that there's billions of galaxies and just our little slice of the universe has 100 billion alone. That's just the little cul-de-sac that we live in. But then there's more and there's a greater neighborhood and then there's a greater city and then there's a greater just nation and country and, and world of stars, this universe. And, and God knows every one of them and he has created every one of them. But like I said, numbers that big just confuse me and it, they become like, okay, you could say any number at that point. So, so here's just a little illustration that I, that I discovered, a little story that I discovered. In 2006, we spent a, a, sent a spacecraft out into space called the New Horizons, 2006. And after nine years of traveling, it finally made, made it to Pluto. But get this, it wasn't just like 900 or nine years, sorry, nine years of traveling at like 200 miles an hour, because that wouldn't have gotten it like anywhere. This spacecraft travels at 31,000 miles an hour. 31,000 miles an hour this little spacecraft travels. You'd think that at 31,000 miles an hour you'd be able to get anywhere quick, but at 31,000 miles an hour it still took nine years to get to Pluto which is still in our solar system that hasn't even reached like the edge of the beginning of the universe. That's just getting started. And after nine years, it, it, it captured this photo. And that's Pluto. It used to be a planet and, and, and then it wasn't. And then it was a dwarf planet. And now we just don't know. Neil Armstrong, while he was on the moon, he said this. You guys know who Neil Armstrong was. One small step for man, one giant step for mankind. That's one thing. But then, but then he said this other thing. While he's on the moon, he said, it suddenly struck me that that tiny pea, pretty and blue, was the earth. So I put my thumb, I put up my thumb, and I shut one eye, and my thumb blotted out the planet Earth. I didn't feel like a giant. I felt very, very small. And that is precisely what David gets at. When he says, man, I look at the moon, I look at the stars, I look at, at all of this that you've created. What is man? What is man that you are mindful of him? The son of man that you would visit him. He recognizes that man is small. That you and I, in the scale of the universe, we're smaller than atoms. We're smaller than, we're just like the, the, the insignificant. We're dust, lowly. Our days are limited, our impact is small. Each of us, right now, we're just one of 7.5 billion people on earth right now. Doesn't make you feel great, does it? Doesn't make you puff up your chest and say, well, I'm great, I'm fantastic, don't you know who I am? Feel insignificant, and yet, and yet, God is mindful of you. Not just God is mindful of you, but God is mindful of you. And he cares for you. And he knows the thoughts in your head. He knows the hairs on your head. And he has visited you. You see, our God He's not an absentee landlord. Our God isn't missing in action. He is not far off and unreachable. He's near. And since the beginning of creation, he has desired to be near 
with you. I want that to sink in. That's reality. That's not a myth. That's not a philosophy that we adhere to. That is reality, that there is a God who wants to be near with you. His desire has never been to be distant, not attainable, unreachable, which is why we read in Genesis that he walked with Adam in the cool of the day and that he walked with Enoch until Enoch was no more. And that he called Noah to build this ark so that this faithful family who loved God, who was righteous, who sought after him, that they would be preserved so that he could be in relationship with them. And he made a covenant with Abraham saying, I'm going to build a nation out of you. In a nation in which all of the world is going to be blessed because I want to be near to the world. I want to be near to them. And that's why he established a tabernacle through Moses, a place where his glory could dwell and he could meet with man. And that's why he inspired David and Solomon to build this temple, a more permanent dwelling place for him at that time where once a year, the high priest could make atonement and he could be near and we could be in relationship with this God that is holy and is beyond us, even though we have been sinners tainted by our sin. And that's why he gave 16 Old Testament books to be prophets, people that spoke to the people on behalf of God saying, I love you, turn to me, don't follow these idols, don't live your lives wastefully live your lives with purpose and God wants to be near us and that's why through Mary he gave us Emmanuel God with us and nothing nothing screams his love and his longing for us more than the cross of Christ you see he gave his son he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we could become the righteousness of God in him. So that after that, we could say, it's no longer I who live, it's Christ that lives in me. And to his disciples, he told them, it is far better that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you but if I depart, I will send him to you. And he also told those same disciples and he tells us, and lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself so that, so that where I am, you may be also. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice, let him open that door and I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. Surely I am coming quickly, he said. So from Genesis to Revelation, this God that created everything, this God that uses small things for huge significant purposes, he wants to be with you. And when I hear these words, it's easy for me to think I've heard these words several times before. I know that truth. And I can sometimes be callous to that truth. But tonight I'm standing in awe of the fact that there's a creator that cares, that there's a creator that deserves our worship. You see, the God that put Pluto in orbit, the God that holds the universe in the span of his hand, is the God that put your DNA in your blood. He put your breath in your lungs. And he's not far, he is near. And I think he would tell us, draw near to me. I will draw near to you. And so church, can we live our lives 
with this magic kingdom mindset, opening our Bibles, gazing at his goodness, seeing the colors of his character, experiencing and considering the textures of his grace, allowing ourselves to have eyes wide open in awe of the reality that God exists. He knows us. He loves us. And he's coming back for his bride. All of creation screams his praises. The heavens declare it. The rocks would cry out if they could. And I think that right now we can. So let's stand to our feet and let's enter into the rest of this night. Let's enter into this worship, raising our voices to the God that cares, the God that is great, the God that deserves every breath in our lungs and then some. What binds us together is devotion to worshiping our Heavenly Father, dedication to studying His Word, and determination to proclaim our eternal hope in Jesus Christ. For more teachings from Calvary Albuquerque and Skip Heitzig, visit calvaryabq.org.